Dr. Goldacre, thank you for taking part in this interview. Could you please start by explaining your background and what made you decide to move your focus from being a doctor into journalism? Well, I haven't really moved my focus. I've, I've done both um, all along. So um, I guess, you know, I started writing about problems in science because, like a lot of people who know about medicine and science, whenever I saw it being misreported in the media, or heard people say foolish things about it at dinner parties, I got annoyed and I wanted to put the record straight. So I got in touch with The Guardian um, and they very kindly gave me a column to write about this stuff called Bad Science, which I did for a decade. And from that came the book and the last one, Bad Science, sold half a million copies, which is extraordinary. Um, and the blog gets lots of traffic and I've ended up sort of doing bits and bobs of radio and telly here and there. Um, but I, um, I keep up with the day jobs, so I've always had either um, full-time medical jobs or academic jobs, um, and at the moment I'm a research fellow in epidemiology, although I have just gone, well, I mean, I, I am 60% time at the moment on that. And for those not familiar with your writing, could you please explain the focus of your blogs and your books? Uh, yeah, so I write about problems in science, so I write about the way that people misuse science or distort it or misrepresent it. And I take my examples from a wide range of areas. So I talk about dodgy journalism, but also misleading government reports, bad behavior by drug companies, um, uh, silly claims from quacks, lots and lots of different stuff, uh, dodgy PR, that kind of thing. Um, and I do it not because... Um, I'm not a kind of mean person, and it's not interesting just to catalogue who is right and who is wrong. It's more that it's an interesting way to talk about the process and the methods of science. So, for example, um, it's, uh, you know, if, if, if somebody's got something wrong, it's a very good gimmick for explaining how things should work. And so that's really, I think, the only way I could ever possibly have got, um, you know, a column about Bonferroni's correction for multiple comparisons in statistics onto the news pages of The Guardian. And how do you think we can encourage more accurate reporting of science in the British media? I think that's a really interesting and difficult question, actually, um, because uh, obviously with a lot of what I do, it's not just about documenting the problems. I also um, hope that by drawing more attention to them, you can fix them. Um, mm -hmm. So I think firstly, just drawing attention to problems is an important first step. And you can often find that people, other than... Um, you and, you and I will come up with good suggestions on how to fix problems. That's one thing that I've been very struck by actually with um, writing about problems in the pharmaceutical industry is there's a, there's a kind of sense I think amongst some senior doctors and academics and do certainly people in industry that there are these long-standing problems but we're fixing them slowly behind closed doors and, and please don't involve the public in this. But actually the public consists of a lot of very smart clued up people. And often, they can be very helpful themselves in coming up with good solutions of how to fix these problems. In the case of pharma, there's lots of interesting work now being done around, um, you know, interesting stuff that coders can do. There's lots of work that policy people and lawyers can get involved in. In the area of bad journalism, I think, firstly, um, drawing attention to those problems, as I've done, has, I think, been a small part of a kind of wider movement of people being concerned and talking about these things and addressing them. But also, there's been a fantastic upsurge in bloggers, firstly, providing really, really valuable alternatives to dodgy coverage in the media and getting very high traffic. I mean, Bad Science gets between 100 and 200,000 uniques a week, but so do lots of other blogs now. So does Mindhacks. Um, Ed Yong's fantastic science blogs get huge, huge traffic. And, and actually, I think in terms of the problem of dumbing down, that's kind of been fixed now by mainstream media being bypassed, if you like, because there are so many other great sources of information online, not just from independent people, actually, but also it's really great to see so many universities producing unmediated public engagement content, if you like. So stepping away from the old-fashioned model of PR being about approaching journalists and trying to get a very short, dumbed-down piece in a national newspaper, lots of universities now are producing great content and putting it online. Um, so just yesterday, I guess, I, I, I linked to a fantastic piece from um, UCL Social Science Research Unit on um, uh, a kind of pop science 
short book that they've made for, for the general public that anyone can download as a PDF. But it's a kind of greatest hit of social science research on the impact of various different aspects of family and work life on health. And it's a, it's a great piece of pop science written by people who, who really know their stuff. So actually, you know, I think, although there are problems with um, science journalism and, and health journalism sometimes being sensationalist or inaccurate, and those are quite difficult to address, I think the issues of things being dumbed down, I feel very, very optimistic about, much more than I did 10 years ago, just because there are so many great people producing um, alternative sources uh, online. Now, now, you talk passionately about publication bias and the lack of transparency within pharma. What do you think pharma is doing wrong? Um, well, there are a lot of issues in, in, in the pharmaceutical industry that I think are problematic. They're ongoing, and they've been around for a long time without being properly addressed. But that's not to say that there aren't a huge number of very, very good, very ethical professional people working in industry. And I know that, obviously, because I work in medicine and epidemiology, but also I do a lot of speaking and writing and talking, and, and so I know a lot of people who work in industry. And I think it's possible for very good people with strong principles to to participate in in wider um, in wider systems failures that result in people being harmed in quite large numbers without themselves necessarily being bad people as individuals. So that's a really important thing to flag up um, as a kind of starting point. I think beyond doubt the most important issue facing us today is the lack of transparency, and that's a real no-brainer. Um, the reality is. People are allowed to withhold unflattering information about their clinical trials. They always have been, and they still are today. Our best estimate, looking just at publication bias in terms of trials that don't get published in academic journals, is that about half of all of the studies that are conducted and completed never get published. And we know that from studies following up, for example, trials that have been registered on clinical trials registers. But being published in an academic journal isn't the only issue here. Because we also know, and this is quite a, a new realization over the course of the last decade, I suppose, we also know that journal publication isn't the be all and end all. Because we know that there can be lots of methodological tricks, quirks, or distortions that are hidden from sight in academic journal publications. And that's why we often need to have access to the full statistical analysis plan. We need to see the protocol. We need the protocol to be registered before the trial begins so that people can see whether the primary outcomes have been switched, for example, which is a, a, one of many ways that, that the, um, the results can be exaggerated in clinical trials. But then lastly, of course, we need access to just the, the, the results of the study. And we know that laws that have been passed to try and address that have failed. So, for example, the FDA Amendment Act in 2007 was supposed to mean that all trials conducted with at least one site in the US and so on should post their results in basic summary table format to a website called clinicaltrials.gov. Okay. Now, when that law was passed, everybody said, oh, well, this is fantastic because that means that the problem of trial results being inaccessible has been fixed forever. But unfortunately, that turned out not to be the case. I think it's very problematic, actually, that there was no public audit process when that law was set up. But in any case, uh, an audit has now been conducted. It's published by Prail et al. in the British Medical Journal in January 2012. And as a result of that, we know that only one in five of the trials that were supposed to meet that reporting requirement actually complied. So four in five fails to report their results to clinicaltrials.gov within a year. They, they broke the law. And despite that fact, despite that appalling low compliance rate, no fine has ever been levied. And actually, it's worth also adding, if a fine had been levied, it's only $10,000 a day. And although that sounds good, it's, it's still only $3.5 million a year. And that's a fairly trivial kind of parking ticket to a company with revenue in the tens of billions. So we know that publication bias is an ongoing problem. We know that it's not just about trials being withheld from um, doctors and patients in terms of um, whole study reports. We also know that it's about the more sophisticated details being withheld. So for example, 
Um, the Cochrane Collaboration, who are a non-profit academic organization producing gold standard summaries of the risks and benefits of treatments for doctors and patients around the world. We know that they have had information about the conduct of chemistry trials withheld from them by Roche for several years now. And there's nothing controversial about that claim. This is very well documented. If you go to bmj.com slash Tamiflu, you will find extensive documentation. And that's uh, just one illustration of, of how serious this problem is. And mm -hmm. it's also very concerning because the UK government has spent $500 million, um, 500 million pounds, sorry, on stockpiling Tamiflu. Governments around the world, of course, have spent billions of dollars on stockpiling Tamiflu in the belief that it reduces the rate of complications of flu. And that complications is obviously a, a medical euphemism, as I'm sure you know, for, for um, uh, pneumonia and death. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, if we can't get access to vitally important information about the conduct and design of the study from the clinical study reports, which is what Cochrane has been requesting from Roche, if we don't have access to that information, we don't know what the results mean. We don't know if we can trust the results. And so I think we need very simple, clear legislation that says that all information about all clinical trials on all drugs currently in use must be made available to doctors and patients. I find it extraordinary that the ADPI deny that this is an ongoing problem. When we know that clinicaltrials.gov legislation has failed, when we know that Roche are withholding information about Tamiflu, but also I think actually you know, ethical professional people working in the pharmaceutical industry themselves should be signing up to, to actively campaign for more transparency because I actually don't think anybody in industry is helped by the absence of transparency here. I think there is an issue about getting hold of older trials. I think there may be some um, embarrassment there when, when we get hold of information about trials that were done um, 5, 10, 15 years ago, which are, of course, extremely important because that, we, you know, we're still prescribing drugs from, from 5, 10, and 15 years ago. So I think there may be some embarrassment there, but I think actually um, you know, the industry really should be campaigning for everybody to work competitively to high ethical standards. So it's roughly at this point in the conversation always that people raise Andrew Whitty at GSK saying we're going to be more transparent about our clinical trial data. And I think that's really fantastic. I think it's really great. Although GSK does have a history of making and then breaking promises around transparency, so we do have to wait two years maybe to see what the results of these promises are. But I think it's fantastic, and I've got huge respect for Andrew Whitty. But I think we don't solve these problems by individual people being good and nice. We solve these problems by getting regulatory change across the board in industry so that companies aren't obliged, if you like, to compete on... Um, on territory where it's in their interest to behave less ethically. So I think Andrew Whitty and, and, and anybody else working in the pharmaceutical industry um, should come together and themselves actively campaign for greater transparency. And I know that there are some people from the medical writing community who've done that. I know that there are many independent consultants from the pharmaceutical industry who've discussed the merit in that publicly. And I know that there are many individuals who've contacted me um, to say that they're supportive um, of these principles. And I think it would be um, I think it would be really important and powerful if industry could could just be a little bit more transparent. But more than that, um, you know, start campaigning themselves for more transparency. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned many individuals there, but what organisations do you see to be making a more positive change in this area? Well, um, I was very heartened um, with uh, the, the campaign that has arisen just over the last couple of weeks. Um, so I organised a letter to the Times, um, drawing attention to the problem of publication bias and asking for the government to take this problem more seriously, and that was co-signed by the editors of the British Medical Journal, Fiona Godley, Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, Ginny Barber, the editor of PLOS Medicine. So that's the big three medical journals from the UK. It was also signed by Therian Chalmers, the co-founder of the Cochrane Collaboration, the current and previous heads of Cochrane, lots of senior people from academia and medicine, um, Claire Girarda, the president of the Royal College of GPs, which is fantastic. Um, so there's very broad support for, for this being an issue. 
There was a very supportive editorial in the British Medical Journal written again by Fiona Godley, the editor-in-chief, which I think is fantastic. So there's a lot of very positive support from journals. There's a lot of positive support from doctors, although I think that needs to start being put into um, uh, you know, um, motions at um, motions at uh, conferences and into codes of conduct. As I, as I say in the book, I think it, it's really important that the Royal Colleges, the faculties and the societies all stand up and make a clear positive statement that selective non-publication of unflattering information about clinical trials is research misconduct. Because I think, you know, that's, that's certainly very clear. It's a very important ethical issue. I think it's one of the most important ethical issues in medicine. And historically, we've had something of a blind spot about recognizing that that kind of lack of transparency is research misconduct. So I think it's really important that we do more and that we um, sort of formalize the, the fantastic positive statements that have been made by all of those people since the book came out. But, um, but I think it, uh, it's a great start. Um, I'm also really pleased actually to see that the government has started to engage very constructively with this. So um, I went to a meeting yesterday with Earl Howe, who is the Under Secretary of State for Health, so he's uh, you know, the second health minister in the current UK government. And we went along with Fiona Godley, um, editor of the BMJ, Serene Chalmers, co-founder of Cochrane, um, Carl Hennigan, who is the director of the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford. Um, and it was a very positive meeting. I, I, I won't um, discuss, you know, details at this early stage, but it, it, was, it was really, really heartening. And I'm pleased to see there's positive movement there. Um, also very pleased to see... Um, Dr. Sarah Wollaston, who's a GP and now an MP, raising questions about this issue in Parliament. And we've had support from Julian Huppert. Norman Lamb, who's the other um, junior health minister, um, was, um, I, I feel, supportive in his response in Parliament. He said, you know, we recognise that this is an issue um, and uh, helped to arrange the meeting with Earl Howe, which I hope will be the first of many, because I think, um, you know, there are many of us in, in academia and in science who are very keen to um, to help government understand the, the extent of this problem and, and work on addressing it. So I think there's a lot of really, really great positive forward movement here from people who are able to, to, to look at these problems and um, uh, and think of, of ways to fix it. And as I said, you know, I, I think it's really important to involve the public in this discussion because People, you know, the public isn't this sort of amorphous blank blob of humanity. Uh, the public includes people who maybe uh, have legal expertise, coding expertise, lobbying expertise, um, all kinds of different skills that they can bring to bear on helping to manage um, a, a, a comfortable transition for industry from this ongoing problem of poor transparency into a, into a new era. And I think that's, um, that's to be welcomed. And what would you like to see pharma doing to address these issues and manage publication bias? Well, I think the first and most important thing is to um, make a clear public statement that you recognise that this is a problem. So the ABPI, the Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry, so far, I'm very sorry to say really, have engaged in a mixture of personal smears against me, which is a very old-fashioned PR more than anything, and I think doesn't do a good service. To, to the industry. But they've also issued flat, outright blanket denial. So they've said that all of the issues in the book are historical and that all of these problems have been fixed. And that's really very simply not true. As I said, you know, clinicaltrials.gov regulations haven't worked. Roche continue to withhold important information about Tamiflu. And there are many, many more examples of ongoing problems. So I think the first thing that I would say is I think it's really important that people from industry stand up and make a clear statement that these are ongoing problems and engage constructively with people like me, politicians, academics and journal editors who are working towards trying to fix this problem and draw and draw more public attention to it so that we can um, get popular purchase on it. I think we need to have a sense of urgency about this. You know, it, 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 it's a very striking and strange thing, actually. If you're a, if you're a doctor who also does work in academia, you, 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 you start to realize that there is an urgency that you have in A&E when somebody is bleeding to death in front of you. Everybody's running around, everybody's panicking. 
But actually, you know, the very abstract world of academic medicine, of forest plots and blobograms and effect sizes and confidence intervals, it's easy to be fooled into forgetting that all of that stuff really does relate to the very real world of flesh and blood and suffering and death and pain. And actually, I think we need to have a sense of urgency about fixing the problems that result in doctors being misled by having access to biased summaries of information, because not just industry, but also academics are able to hide information about the risks and benefits of treatments. I think we need to have a sense of urgency about this, and I think we need to get on and fix it. So if the question is, what can the pharmaceutical industry do to, to manage publication bias? I think that the simplest, clearest thing that they can do is join with us in forming a coalition to address this problem mm -hmm. and stop pretending that it doesn't happen. Because I think, you know, that's, that's, that's the PR of the 80s, you know, to pretend that things aren't happening and to smear people. I, I, I think the time has come really for people like the ABPI to engage constructively with, with what are very, very, you know, reasonable concerns. I, I don't think it's reasonable in 2012 to say, um, you know, we're not going to talk uh, uh, with people who are raising concerns about publication bias. These are things that need to be fixed. So I would encourage individuals in industry, firstly, to get in touch if they would like to be involved in, um, in um, forming broader coalitions about addressing this problem. My email address is ben at badscience.net, and I'm always pleased to hear from people. Um, we're currently building a website at www.alltrials.net, which will have further resources, and I hope that people from industry, either in an individual capacity or in a kind of broader capacity, will be able to sign up to that. Um, and that's a kind of, you know, that's a, that's not, that's not a website about me flogging books. That's, yeah. that's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's about, collecting together people and information from, from the professions and also from the public uh, and drawing together resources. So I would encourage people to get involved and to support those, um, those, those initiatives. And, and I'd be very pleased to hear from anybody who's got anything constructive to add on this. Mm -hmm. Now, shifting the focus back to you as a doctor, pharma interacts with doctors and receives criticism in this area. Looking at just that area, how should pharma be better interacting with physician, physicians? Well, I mean, as I say in the book, this is actually something that I think is much less important than the problem of transparency in medicine. Um, it's, everybody kind of vaguely knows the story of doctors see drug reps and drug reps give them a biased perspective on the risks and benefits of treatments and there's industry funded teaching which also has biased content from from what we know of the research that's been done on it and it would obviously be it would be ludicrous and unrealistic to imagine really that it wouldn't I mean I don't think you could get the public to take that notion very seriously um, but actually I don't think this is the most important issue and I don't particularly think that pharma are the bad guys here I think this is a, a systems failure as I say in the book I I, you know, if you put me in charge of MRC funding for the next year, the, the, the medical funding in the UK, I would cancel all primary trials research just for one year, and I'd spend all the money that we have on on better ways of synthesizing, summarizing evidence, and then better ways of disseminating it to practitioners, better ways of disseminating it to decision makers, which means not just doctors, but also nurses, nurse practitioners, prescribing nurses, but also physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and commissioners of health services. I think we've been actually quite good in medicine generally, in comparison with, say, education or politics, at developing an evidence base for the decisions that we make. But I think we've been very bad at synthesizing individual pieces of information together disseminating them to practitioners and, and auditing how those decisions are put into practice. So I think that doctors should be much better at doing that. Academics should be much better at doing that. I think that should be a much higher priority for the Department of Health. I think there are huge savings to be made in getting people to implement the evidence we already have as efficiently as possible. So make cost-effective decisions 
uh, and and you know make sure that you're using the cheapest statin if there's no evidence that more expensive statins are better. But also then that frees up money to spend more money on um, truly innovative new products from the pharmaceutical industry because of course you know people do make good drugs and people should be able to make money out of good drugs. I think they currently are. I think actually one of the problems for innovation in the sector is that you can also make money out of drugs that aren't very good. And I, and I don't think that that should be a right for the industry. I think it's reasonable to say we should get better at disseminating good quality information and also generating good quality information so that doctors can make informed decisions and they can spend money on good drugs and not spend money on drugs that are more expensive but only equally effective. So in answer to the question, how can pharma interact with doctors better? Well, actually, I think it should be irrelevant. Uh, I think to, to the public, it's, it's, it's extraordinary that doctors are effectively trained once they qualify by the pharmaceutical industry in very many cases. I think when the public hear stories about, um, about uh, continuing professional education paid for by, doc by pharmaceutical companies, they regard that as, as, as laughable, corrupt, and obviously um, likely to result in biased decision making. Um, but but I, I think, you know, I'm not surprised that industry wants to offer those kinds of services. I'm not surprised that doctors are willing to take free continuing medical education. But I think really, you know, we have to up our game at getting better systems in place for disseminating information. It's important actually, just as a kind of, as a sort of final sidestep, you know, um, the, the, the medical world is a very, very interesting and peculiar corner of public procurement, if you like, because it's an area of public procurement where huge amounts of money are being spent, but by individuals, doctors, spread all across the country and each in their own small atomic corner of, of the NHS. Now, I think that, 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 that we should view this as, an, as a question of how can we optimize procurement by making sure that prescribing and treatment decisions by doctors are as rational and evidence-based as possible. And I think that the, the cost of creating evidence and disseminating evidence to reduce irrational prescribing, inefficient prescribing, is almost certainly less than the cost of the inefficient prescribing itself. And so I think there's a clear win here for, for everybody. I think it's a clear win for, for, for government because I don't think we'd lower the drug budget, but we'd certainly get better value from it. And I think in the long run there's a, a clear win for industry. I don't think industry is helped by being able to make profit from drugs which are, um, which are more expensive than their generic competitors, but no more effective. Because I think that, that kind of um, misaligned incentives, uh, those kinds of misaligned incentives um, send a very poor signal for innovation. I think if you want to get people to innovate, you have to reward excellence in the pharmaceutical industry and not reward um, uh, mediocre drugs. Dr. Goldacre, thank you very much for your time and for your insights.